the third button and then. <laughs> okay, turn with me to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. This is a very interesting psalm, Psalm 19. It, uh, it's got uh, <clears throat> some unique information in it. And the way that the Lord lays it out <clears throat> is, uh, is on, a, on the basis of a building process. So let's just look at Psalm 19. Um, the first six verses, we'll read, they are about nature. The next five are about the law, and then the last three are about personally uh, David's conscience. So let's read it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. <clears throat> day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. <clears throat> In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing like a strong man to run a race. Um, his goings forth is from the end of the heavens and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hidden from the heat thereof. Okay, now verse 7 begins dealing with the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great re reward. <clears throat> now, from verse 11 to the end, is dealing with personal issues and uh, personal conscience. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. <clears throat> Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. <clears throat> um, when I first was going through some of the Psalms, just trying to decide which ones I was going to share, Psalm 19 stood out to me, but I had a, uh, a uh, sort of a, a book, a commentary type book that was, <clears throat> I thought I'd pick it up and just see what it said about this particular psalm. And it said that David seemed to be sort of confused. That he talked about the beauty of nature and then he talked about the law and then he was all down and out about his personal situation. <clears throat> and so David was just having a rough day, the day he wrote Psalm 19. <clears throat> and um, you know, I would really suggest that you, you use a grain of salt when you read commentaries. <clears throat> the best person to go to is the Holy Spirit. And he will show you, maybe not immediately, <clears throat> but if you ask, the Holy Spirit is faithful and he will lift up Christ to you. I happen to believe that all of these are a progression <clears throat> of the dealing of the Lord. Um, and this, uh, this first part, and, and uh, I've, I've also discovered the quickest way to finish a course and actually get through the whole course properly, unlike we did last semester where we only covered three psalms. And that secret is just read. If I would just read to you my notes, then we would do good. But I comment, and then we go off and lose track. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you my summary <clears throat> on this, beginning with the first part, which deals with nature, verses 1 through 6. First he thinks of the sky, how day after day it is steady and shows the splendor of the Lord. It is 
consistent and unchanging. He thinks of the sun and the voids that it takes as it covers the whole sky in length. Finally, the heat. That's uh, verse 6. And there is nothing hidden from the heat thereof. <coughs> uh, the heat, the incessant heat. It pierces everywhere. It pow its pounding rays melt the earth and bring it to its knees. It searches every part of the earth. Okay? <coughs> then verses 7 through 11 dealing with the law. Then he speaks of the law. It is like the all-piercing, all-detecting sunshine that exposes everything, and it is like the heat that brings all to its knees and shows earth its weaknesses. The law gives light like the sun. The law is undefiled like the heavens. No one can improve on it. Like the heat, it is severe, it is enlightening, and it is disinfecting. <clears throat> and then finally, verses 12 through 14, Lastly, it deals with personal conscience and David's secret faults. It is the same manner as when he felt the sun in the desert searching him out in every nook. He sought out shade in an attempt to hide from it. So the law searches out all the hiding places of the soul. The searching and cleansing of the sun is a God-given picture of the searching and cleansing law as well as the actions of the conscience. <clears throat> Um, that's my summary. That's just a basic thing to get you on track with, with the progression to just sort of see in general that David is not confused. <laughs> he is, things are falling in place very clear to him and he's beginning <clears throat> to connect what God made, what God wrote, what God made inside of man to draw him to himself, that all of these things are the handiwork of God working to bring about certain things that we'll get into a little more specifically here in just a moment. <clears throat> and so uh, let's see. Let, let's uh, keep your place here, and let's go to uh, Romans chapter 1. I think Romans 1 here will take us a, a step further into this thing that, that um, David is trying to share with us. Here it says, uh, verse 19, Romans 1:19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> and Paul here is... Uh, and he's about to move into the second phase shortly in chapter 2 and chapter 3, dealing with the Jews and the law. Right now, he's dealing with all people that, that, have, that are on this planet, that God has not left them without a witness. And he's saying that that witness is in his creation, that it is manifest, that the things made are speaking of the invisible things of him. Notice those, that word, not just invisible things, not just invisible mysteries per se. And I, I, the reason why I say that is <clears throat> I used to you know, love talking about the mysteries of God because in my heart, I believe it was sort of here, in that it was these wonderful openings. To me, a mystery was a wonderful opening of the Lord in a, in a unique way where you could see him and embrace him uh, from the heart. You know, some people take that, and even the word mysteries, and they go off, and it can be anything from a sort of a new age approach to, <clears throat> to just becoming deeper. And let's just get deeper, and let's just know mysteries, and let's just know stuff. And, and that's not the Lord's heart, and that's not my heart. I don't want to just know stuff. I want to know the Lord. And this is not saying that you could know the invisible things of mysteries. This is saying that you can know 
through those things, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. And so um, he's, Paul is actually setting forth this thing in Romans, and it's one of the few doctrinal treatises that is, that is putting forth uh, things in sort of a orderly manner. And he's saying that even people who aren't Jews have a witness. They have the truth being shared with them. And David is saying that in that psalm. We'll, we'll dig. I just, I just gave you a summary. I just gave you a little bit of the icing on top. We haven't really discussed what David's saying there yet. Um, and then just so that we, we see this since we're here instead of dragging you back over here, <clears throat> look in uh, Romans 3, verse 1. <clears throat> Uh, and beginning in verse 2, before you read that, beginning in verse 2, in the next couple of chapters, he moves from the Gentiles, and he moves from just the, the people groups of the earth, and he moves to dealing with the Jews. And when he does, he starts dealing with the law. And, and uh, when I say the law, um, you know, our minds automatically go to something there. They would understand it as the Torah. Okay? It's just the Torah. But we say the law, and we go, oh, you know. I mean, it's their book and, the, and <clears throat> whatever. So uh, verse 1 here of Romans 3, What advantage then hath a Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because unto them was committed the oracles of God. And the oracles of God relate to the scriptures and relate to the word and relate to, well, let's look over in, uh, uh, let's look in chapter 2, verse 17. And if thou art called a Jew and, and resteth in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent, all of that is talking about that God gave them the word. He gave them the Torah. He spoke to them. He gave them beyond what a heathen could give. And from 3, one Romans 3, one we can assume that there is an advantage. Can I say this? There is a progression. There is a progression. Okay? And so, um, let's see what else it says here. Knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent, that's the word, being instructed out of the law. And so, it is, it is declaring before he shows that that's fine, the law is telling you how to live, but if you don't live it, there's going to be a problem. Because it's not, it's not an advantage just having the law if you're just going to violate it. Okay. Um, let's go back to uh, Psalm 19 now. <clears throat> the heavens, which uh, you see that in the book of Revelation, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, very common. The, the, the heavens are not just sitting there. They are declaring. The heavens declare the glory of God. They are declaring. They're not just sitting there. They are declaring, um, and they're declaring God, and they are showing us of him, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. <clears throat> day after day and night after night, they are speaking continuously to the inhabitants of the earth. There is no tongue or language where his voice is not heard, speaking of the sun, moon, and stars in the way that he just described it here. Um, there's no tongue or language where this voice is not heard, no part of the planet, no people group that does not daily see the sun, the day, the night. Their story goes throughout all the earth, and their message is seen by all. Creation reveals something of his heart and of his nature. God uses nature to show manifestations of his reality. God has given them to declare his works and his own character. Nature is solid. It's permanent. Like him, they are reliable. And I'm, I haven't yet to get into the purpose for which he's reliable. The thing that makes him reliable, the thing that not makes him, but it, that to which he is reliable. But nonetheless, um, uh, like him, they are reliable. All his works are faithful. He spake, 
and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's over just a couple of Psalms over, Psalm 33. Uh, day unto day, night unto night, this course, the course of the sun, this course, this stability, this timing that is faithful down to minutes and seconds, it all speaks to us. It speaks of God and his stability. It utters knowledge about God, if we were to hear it. And the, uh, uh, the first verse there, the actual Hebrew there is the heavens declare, uh, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. They are. This is not that they did once, they did it creation, they did, they are yet declaring the glory of God. And it's, and that glory is written in the sky. It's God's word, and there's God's word in scripture, which we haven't dealt with yet, the law, the Torah. And then there's God's word in heaven, in the heavens, or in the sun, moon, and the stars. Um, we have the example of the three wise men, and they, they found it, and it led them where? Straight to Jesus. And so um, God wrote the heavens, and he wrote the book. He's the author of both. Now, now I want you to think about something. Why, would God be any more um, into the book than he would creation? And the truth is, he wouldn't because of this stability that we haven't talked about yet, because of this commitment to a path, just like the sun, this commitment to a path over and over and over. He will not turn from that. And he proved it by the heavens, and he proved it in his word, and he proved it when he sent his son. So... Uh, I was watching last night on PBS. I'd seen it before. Uh, anybody seen, uh, seen this? It was on PBS. It's called The History of Chaco. Uh, it wasn't Valley. What was it? History of Chaco. Uh, well, it's like a valley, but I, that's not the right word that they used. Um, anybody? Anybody? Okay. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it. Now, this wasn't a Christian thing. This was strictly a study of the um, Pueblo Indians and what they had built. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit. This was on last night. And if it was on last night, it'll probably be on again. Um, again, they weren't Christian. They weren't trying to make any point about Jesus at all. They were uh, historians and um, archaeologists, and what have you, and they had unearthed in the desert all of these buildings that were separated, uh, that, that some of them were close together. Uh, in fact, the way they showed it was a, a aerial view that was like, you know, 40, 50 miles, and they showed in that aerial view these little pueblos that they had built and then they came in a little closer and then they showed some within that and then they came in a little closer and they showed some within that and then they came to the center and the, the center one had um, five different, uh, maybe I can draw a little bit of this for you, uh, five different buildings. And I'm not gonna try to draw the shape at this point but I'm just gonna show you that the, the center one was called Pueblo Benito. Okay, well, that would be Benjamin. That's Spanish for Benjamin. Now, if you know anything about Benjamin, Joseph, they were brothers, Joseph and Benjamin were, were brothers, and Joseph represented Christ as an individual, the one who came and died as an individual, went through all that stuff, you know, and Benjamin represented him also, but in resurrection. And that he was put away, even though he was on a throne, even though he was raised, you didn't see Joseph. But Benjamin was raised up, and he, began, he, he was the 
beloved son. But Benjamin has always represented what I call from the uh, tabernacle. You may not know this, but the tabernacle is full of a certain kind of fruit. It's called pomegranate fruit. And if, you, if you've ever seen pomegranates, they're just one big piece of fruit until you open up the skin. And then the whole fruit is nothing but seeds with, with like something you can eat on it. But I mean, it's just full of seeds. So a pomegranate son would be Christ, but all of us in Christ. And all of us of him and one with him. Well, Pueblo Benito is Benjamin and represents that. Now, you know, again, I'm not, I'm just going to, I'm going to try to show you some things that I think are significant here. And over here, there was another Pueblo. And if you'll notice the thing, and of course, it would be better if I had all this all equal the way they did. And then they had one up here. And then they had one down here. Let's say it was about down here. And these buildings were built in a certain way, all in relationship to the sun. Okay, all in relationship to the sun. And to follow the course of the sun in its full course takes 18 and a half years. Okay, in the full course of that. So that would mean that somebody would not only have to figure it out the first time around, but watch it and probably watch the pattern of the sun for generations. In other words, a people dedicated to watching the course of the sun instead of the course of the earth. Okay. And so here they are. They are, after centuries or however long that it was that they were there, they began, they built these buildings. <clears throat> and they had a wall, and uh, right, well, let's see, the, the wall here, and see, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't equal. But they had a wall within this Pueblo, and it was right about here. I don't know that it was perfectly centered in the building, but it was right about there. And this wall, when they went a certain distance over here, they found out that there was another wall here. And then pretty far down here, there was another wall right there. <clears throat> and when they got on it with a, uh, whatever you call it, a laser or whatever, and they shot this thing, they saw that this was an exact perfect straight line. Now this is, this is a fairly good distance, but this is just the small one. There's, a, there's bigger and bigger built in within this thing. They shot this line and they found out that it was exactly north and south. Not off anything. Exactly north and south based on the movements of the sun. And as it moved, the shadow would disappear at a certain time and this sort of thing. And then they noticed that there was another wall, though, in this one, and then something similar over here and something similar over here. And when they shot it, it also was exact. And that that was <clears throat> the dividing of the seasons. It was, what do you call it, the uh, summer and winter equinox? No, no, it's equinox, isn't it? Or is it solstice? I thought the solstice was, but anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that it is the exact dividing of the seasons. And this one was the exact dividing of, as it were, time. Okay. And, and so here, this is like incredibly perfect. And when you stretch this thing out beyond this into the bigger picture, it all stayed true too, but right in the center of this was this Pueblo Benito, and everything met here in the center of that. And so then, and they're, they're doing these excavations, and they're doing all this stuff, and they're finding it out as they go, so they didn't always put it in order. But they found out that this, this one right here, leading to Pueblo Benito, that this one was actually a 30 meter, I forget, 30 foot road that extended right on down uh, past this Pueblo that was right here and was straight, perfectly straight, and extended straight down where clearly they had used it as a road and it came right to the end of a cliff down here. And they thought, why would you build a road 30 feet long <laughs> I mean, 30 feet wide, and 
this, it stretched from this Pueblo down to there 34 miles. That's a long way. Okay? <clears throat> and so they got to the edge of this cliff, and it's the Badlands, and it totally drops off down into there. And so they went down there and they started looking around, not knowing what they were going to find. They got down to the bottom of the thing, and down there were all these broken vessels at the foot of the cross here. Where when you come to Jesus, you come as a broken vessel. And down here, you cast yourself upon him in the cross, and you lay it all down at the cross, okay? But this is all now based on the bigger picture of the sun, okay? on the bigger picture of the sun. Now up here, and I couldn't, I, because I was catching this as I went, so I didn't, I went, wait, where was that? No, I didn't have anyone to ask questions. But up here, they had another place with broken vessels, but it was a big mound, and they all would come and break their vessels, and it was understood, and one of the guys said, now this mound, that's a typical offering that this mound is made of. And it's an offering of broken vessels, which is different than these broken vessels. This one is you come to the foot of the cross and you lay down your life. But this mound was them offering to God. Number one, present your body a living sacrifice. Number two, Christ is the one who is given. Okay, so here they're going through this. And now I can't even tell you the, the magnitude of this because when this, this road uh, stops here, but if you keep going, it matches up to a lo another Pueblo that is, you know, so far away you can't see it. There's a, there's a mountain blocking it. In, in other words, if we had a laser, we couldn't shoot it. But it was perfectly lined with all of this. And every ounce of it, now, here's the deal. These Pueblos, you're not going to see all this unless you're looking from above. Did you hear what I said? You're going to have to be way high up above looking down on the earth to really see this and to really catch this. Because when they said they first started excavating this, they just thought it was a bunch of random buildings in different places until they started noticing these walls that were straight lines and it would lead to all this stuff. And they started shooting and they went, you know, this was their religion. This was, you know, and, uh, and, and don't think for a minute that I think that they understood Jesus in the depths or anything like that. But, you know, this says in Psalms 19, and so uh, let's, let's move to verse 4 through 6. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> their line has gone out through all the earth and the words to the end of the world in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun and the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing like a strong man to run a race his going forth is from the end of the heavens and his serpent unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hidden from the heat thereof. And then he starts getting into the law. So let me read some of this. David declares that the creation shows God's power and handiwork, but it is the sun that is singled out as the chief witness of God's glory. The sun is the chief witness of this whole process. And he didn't, he didn't mention sun, moon, and stars. He mentioned sun. It is the king of the story. The rest of the heavens are his tabernacle, his tent. And it says that, his bridegroom chamber. The race that he runs is different from the race as we understand it. He, he runs to obtain a bride. He is strong in his intention to this end and runs hard but patiently. The light and the warmth of his passion for this bride is seen in his creation. Because that sun is, is lending light and warmth to the whole earth. Everybody, every human being on this planet is sustained by the course of the sun that David saw and said to be, this is the Lord, the sun, moving toward the end, which is to gain a bride for himself. This is not just uh, creation 
I flung it. You know, have you ever heard, you know, God flung the creation into existence? Well, he didn't just fling it. He said it. He set it in order, and he set it so that it would declare his glory and declare him. And so um, uh, this end goal is felt by all who partake of the sun's light and its warmth. Together with the sun, all of creation declares this glory. And this is what he means, because this is verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork, and this is the glory that he's talking about. He's not talking about random glory. He's not talking about creation glory. He's talking about creation that declares the glory of God. He's talking about creation that declares the reality of God, that declares the heart of God, that declares the intention of God. That's the thing that, he's, that David is taken with. And so... Um, so I, I said, together with the sun, all of creation declares this glory. Comes forth as a bridegroom, it says. It's a picture of him who comes forth and shows his light on earth just to get a bride. This is the light of the earth, the sun in its course. This is a picture of Christ in his course just to get a bride for himself and the light and the warmth and everything that that sun brings is only a type and shadow as far as God was concerned because what does it say well before the foundation of the world God had a plan amen before the foundation of the world but God God created the earth he created it in such a manner that it would speak of his heart for whosoever could hear it, for those that could, could understand it, that those could, who could see it. Um, the, in this story uh, uh, of this uh, Chaco, whatever it is, uh, valley, um, it, it even gets into the movements of the moon, which represent the church. And it has this circle connected with it right up here at the top. At the bottom, it, there's this fall off. And this, this is one big arrow that points to this circle. And it shows the riding or the, the, the movement of the moon from center to outward or outward to center, however you want to put it. And of course, the, you know, we believe that the moon represents the church. We believe that just like the sun uh, will we'll be out and he's bright and he's bringing health and life and everything else. The moon is made of nothing but reflective material. The moon has no light of its own or of her own. But she does have light, his light. And she, she the moon, if, she, if the moon truly represents the church, then when the sun is out of sight, because he's on the side of the earth where people are open to the sun and receiving the sun and receiving the warmth and having light, then on the dark side of the earth, the only witness of the sun is the moon. And the moon is up there shining forth only the reflection of the sun so that whatever light anybody has that's in darkness, Whatever light anybody has in the dark side of the earth, they're getting that witness from the church because they don't see the sun. They don't know the sun. They don't have the sun. And so it is the responsibility. You know, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But then he said, you are the light of the world, didn't he? He said, as long as I'm here, I'm the light of the world. Well, as long as the sun is shining, it's the light of the world. But when it moves away where that part of the earth cannot see him anymore, you are the light of the world. Now you are the one. But, but in, in reality, we're not deceived by that. We're not puffed up. We don't think anything of ourselves because we know that we are just as dead as Pluto or, or Jupiter or any other planet that has no, you know, that's not a sun. Jesus is the sun. And we're not. And we don't have that power within ourselves. We don't have all of that. But we were made. And, and it's always just amaze me. We are made with the ability to reflect the sun. We are made 
just like the moon is, to be able to show forth. And it's, it, is, it is a glory, but it's not the glory of the moon. It's the glory of the sun. And so, um, let's see, where it was. <clears throat> it is a picture of him who comes forth and shows his light on earth just to get a bride. His course is all about gaining the bride of his heart. He cometh forth as a bridegroom, coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth like a strong man to run the race. He's got strength to run this race, to gain this bride. He's got it in his heart. It motivates him. Have you, have you, ever, uh, have you ever been asked to do a job that wasn't in your heart and you weren't motivated to do it? <clears throat> Have you ever been asked to do a job that you really were glad because you really liked doing that? You know, and you go, yeah, okay, I, I like this. Well, he cometh forth out of his chamber like a bridegroom, strong man, ready to run this race. And, and the reality of that is every day when that sun comes up, he makes a course across the sky, and it is a declaration. He is running. He is doing all he can to gain a bride, not just gain saved people, not just, not just to get people saved, but to bring them into oneness with himself so that they might, may partake of his divine nature, so they may, they may shine him forth so that they may be in oneness with him so that he will have one after his kind. And so every day, every day, that strong man rises up and runs. And I, I think of these Pueblo Indians, and I think of the tribes down in, in South America, and I think of the, the tribes in Africa, and I think of all the places all over the world. And, and most of them, most of them knew that there was something about the sun. Now, you know, we're pagan, so, you know, or mankind is pagan until they find the Lord, so how are they going to fully understand everything? But some take it to a degree where it represents mankind. It represents, you know, all sorts of things that pertain to man. But I believe there were races, I believe there were people groups that they honored God in the sun, but they didn't know who he was. They couldn't explain him. They had no explanation. But something of their heart said, this relates to God somehow. And, and you say, well, where, why would you believe that? And where would you get that from? Because Romans tells us, number one, that that's true. Romans chapter one makes it clear. But more than that, I don't believe that God would just say, well, the, the, only the Jews in a little part of the globe, they're the only ones who got it, and everybody else can't get it. I just don't believe that, you know. I haven't told this story in a while, but when this church was on Bolivar Street, <clears throat> we had a lady that was um, a school teacher, been a school teacher all her life. She was getting older then. And uh, <clears throat> I was talking about something like this, <clears throat> and she said, I've got a book for you you're going to love. I said, what is it? She said, it's a history book, History of Texas. And I said, I like History of Texas. She said, no, no, you're going to love this book, not because it's about Texas, but because it's about the Lord. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, originally when the history was written, they used to put in all the stuff that pertained to the church and the Lord and all this because, folks, a lot of the people that came over here were missionaries and what, and what have you. I mean, you know, you don't hear any of that in history now, but that was the thing. I mean, even, even American history, you know, of the colonies and all that, you know, there's so much of the Lord and all that, and you don't hear all that. But anyway, so she wanted to talk about Texas history, and she wanted me to read this book. And I said, well, what kind of book is it? And she said, it, it's a public school book written way back when. Okay? So this isn't some Christian book that somebody wrote so that they could explain to everybody that, you know, I'm telling you this. This was a public school book way back when, and they later took this out. <clears throat> You know, I'm sorry that I can't remember which one it was, Cabeza de Vaca, or one of the explorers I'm sure you're familiar with, um, Coronado, and many of those guys went through Texas, okay? I can't remember which one. But the story is that they landed um, close to the Mississippi, uh, trying to come into the mouth of the Mississippi, and they, their, their ship wrecked, and they made it ashore, and a bunch of people died 
<clears throat> so they started, they, they, you know, they pretty much lost everything, and, and uh, so they just decided that we need to make our way around Texas and go all the way down to Mexico, and down in Mexico, there was a major place where ships were still coming in, and there was a, a settlement, and Spaniards and, you know, Italians and all the explorers were there, and we've got to get to there. <clears throat> so they make this trick, trek, and as they do, people are dying off from poisonous snakes and, you know, lack of food and all this stuff, and they, they get to uh, this one point in Texas, and their clothes are all ripped up. They've been walking for, you know, it was a year and a half, two years, I forget what it was, and they're still not even close to being there, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, beards are all grown, all the fancy, you know, all the conquistador armor and all of that, it's gone. They're just walking in rags. And, they, you know, and it tells about how, you know, uh, they, they killed buffalo and used their hides for their shoes but that was too rough, and the Indians taught them how to use deer skin and stuff like that. It was, it's just a great book. I mean, it really was just the history of these guys. <clears throat> and so they got to uh, this certain place, and they were, they were down to three or four people. Now, that's a pretty big group of people to have made this thing. You know, a hundred or more had died. And they, get, and they come into this tribe of Indians, and some of the Indians were bad and some were good. <laughs> And these Indians saw them coming into the camp, and they just went, oh, and they took them in, and they called them over and everything. And, and, um, uh, and there were a bunch of sets of Indians that they had trouble with and didn't have trouble with. And this particular one, they went in there, and they started saying, you know, tell us about your God. Tell us about your God. And he said, they weren't even, they were like, you know, they weren't really Christians per se. I mean, they were believing in God now because they had, you know, yeah, they had to. But it wasn't like they were missionaries. And, the, he, and so they were barely communicating and stuff, but they found out that this particular tribe of Indians, in their folklore, way, way back, handed down for all generations, was that there were going to come some white men, and they'd never seen white men before. So they were going to come some white men, and they were going to tell them about the true God. <laughs> and so these guys shared with them, you know, about God, Jesus dying on the cross. You know, they were, I'm sure they were Catholics, you know, and all this. And, and they all got saved, you know. And then they, they were going on around, and they, they keep going and stuff like this. And they came into this one tribe, and they, and they saw them, and they said, uh, uh, they took them to the chief, and the chief said, my son, this is a whole other tribe, my son is in this tent, and he's dying, and I need you to heal him. And they said, look, we don't, we're not, we're not doctors. <laughs> I'm a conquistador, not a doctor, Jim. Anyway, <clears throat> anyway, uh, you know, we're not doctors. We don't know how to, you know, do this. And, um, they said, look, you know, it's real simple. Go in there and get him healed or we're going to kill you. <laughs> and they're going, oh, my God, you know, which really helped their, their uh, earnestness in their prayers. <laughs> and so the chief comes in with them and the witch doctor and all this stuff. And so they're standing there. And, and you know, they're just, you know, they don't know. So they make the sign of the cross. They make the sign of the cross. They, you know, go, oh, God, you got to do something here. We're calling. God healed the kid. And so they said, what is this, what is this, it's the cross. And so they explained to them what the sign of the cross was and everything. And that tribe received the Lord because they said this is the true God. <clears throat> anyway, I say all that to say, God can speak to people groups. God has done it. And uh, Mallory, if you don't believe it, ask Mallory because she's, didn't you do a whole study on all of this? And Okay. And uh, what is it? Eternity in Their Hearts by um, Elizabeth Elliot? Was it? No, no. Okay. Eternity in Their Hearts is a book that is talking about these people groups that had, you know, different people came upon them and found out that they had something in their oral history about Jesus or about, you know, listening to these people. So, so I say all of that, and I do think it's pertinent. I say all that to say 
that this that in God's heart and God's attention when he made the sun moon and the stars and when he set the sun in its course he knew exactly what he was doing and these people right here found it out marked it out and you know and to whatever degree understood that the sun was the thing that they should draw from and that they gain their understanding and their wisdom from so let's see I'm not sure oh yeah um, his course is all about gaining the bride of his heart. His path is not diverted. He holds to the same path day after day. It's just incredible. Because why? Because God set the sun in its course and therefore it will do that? No. He's trying to demonstrate this is my desire. Oneness with you was my desire. I initiated that. I wanted that. I set up the tabernacle in the wilderness and came down. I could have stayed up there. His whole heart is to be with us. And we say, well, I don't think God really wants to be with us. I don't think Jesus really wants, you know. And we go through all that stuff. I don't think he really loves me. I don't, you know, I don't really see signs of his. Well, if you want to see a sign of it, go out and look at the sun. <laughs> you know, go look at the sun. Just go out and watch it every day and watch that course and know that that's just a picture of the solid commitment on the part of the Lord that when this thing ends he's going to have a bride after his kind in his image that's going to love him and be with him are you raising your hand back there then speak for it And that's, that is where we're headed, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so both rising and going down into darkness are for a bride, and that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. The sun rising, the sun going down into darkness, that's death, burial, and resurrection. That is this process by which he gets his bride through the cross, through the resurrection. And it's a testimony to that. Um, soon the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth, the knowledge of his purpose to gain a bride. You know, and, and I mean, just consider that. We talk about the knowledge of the Lord covering the earth. Well, that knowledge is covering, it's declaring this reality of God. Um, <clears throat> that knowledge, that purpose to gain a bride, to, to gain one with whom he can fellowship, that, that sees things as he does, he is selfless. We are selfish. To be brought into that, he's going to have to wash us with the water of the word, which is coming up next. <clears throat> if any will lift up his head and look, he will see God's purposes. In his course, he reaches every end of the earth and proclaims his purpose to the whole earth. None are in the dark as to what his intentions are. His light is shined to all men, no matter how far or how dark it is. The universe is his tabernacle and the earth his people. He has an ordered circuit that he daily displays before them. All are warmed by his path, whether they recognize the intention or not. And that, I mean, that's a, that, I liked that because that means he's going to do his course. He's going to get his, he's going to go his course, whether we figure it out or not. You know, uh, 
it's in him to do this. He set the creation in motion. And, you know, I mean, we say that. Okay, he wants a bride, so he set the creation in motion so he could come down here and get a bride. Well, is that true or not true? Yes, it's true. Okay, but he also set it in motion so he could show that he wanted to get a bride. You know? Um, <clears throat> the universe is his tabernacle. Well, let's see. All are warmed by his path, whether they recognize it, the, the intention or not. This son, S-O-N, this son is not reserved for Israel. He is the glory of his people Israel, but also he's a light to lighten the Gentiles. <clears throat> and he has the intention that all the ends of the earth might know what is in his heart. All right. How much time we got on that there clock? Okay, we may stop. It's just that I want to make sure that I have enough time to cover the rest of this. But we're going to go ahead and stop a few minutes early. Uh, and the next we will deal with is this law of the Lord, the, the truth of his word, the truth of why, he, why it is like a son and why it brings forth uh, or how it brings forth what's in his heart to be brought forth. So let's take a break and we'll come back in a few minutes.